All right, let us do a quick recap. We saw how to plot very simple one line, describe the x and then simply say plot. We saw how to add some extra fittings to the plots like title, x axis, y axis labels. We could change the color of the plot, we could change the thickness of the line of the plot, we could also add some annotations to inside the plots. Then we closed around the idea of interactive sessions commands being available to us in a history and the ability to select, selectively save them into a script and run the script. That last part probably went away a little fast, so let us do it again. We saved it, then we run minus i. You will see the difference this time is the plot is not automatically shown. That is for a reason. When you interactively do anything, it is assumed that you want to see the result. When you run a script, it is assumed whatever you want to do, you will make it part of the script. So, there is a show command which you need to run in order to see the output. So, you can put the show command inside the script itself, but that is a very unlikely thing. That is not because the scripts by definition are not used for interactive work. Scripts are used to routinely get the thing done without having to go through step by step. All right. Like I said before we broke, you rarely just want to show a plot a chart on the screen and leave it with that. You want to save it into a picture, paste it into a report and do something along those lines. For that we need the save fig command. Let us use it again and see. could have given any name. The type of the file is decided by the extension you give. Save fig and save it as PNG, PDF, PS, EPS. Since you have done some LaTeX, EPS files are the easiest to embed inside LaTeX. You can see there is a file sign.png here. So, that file would be in your system also if you have saved it. Identify the default location where it saves. It will save in the current directory. You can of course, specify a path and make it save somewhere else. So, this file can be now used in different contexts for you can embed it into a document, into a LaTeX document, preparing a report, etcetera. We made a comment till now. Whatever command you give is additive, it goes on adding to the existing command, correct. Whatever output is there, any new command adds the output to the same. We, we did one thing in order to fix it that was clear the picture using CLF. Let us take a slightly bad example, so that we can understand what point we are trying to make. So, what is this lint space all about? Starting from 0 to 50, 10 points. Now, the points are very, very coarse.
as you can see it is a very funny sign curve because the number of points we have chosen are very very small. So, it does not come out as, as smooth as we should it, uh, we normally should get. Now, let us change it to instead of 10 points we will change it to 500. So, it will be lot more points lot more lot smoother but you will find the picture is overlaid this is the default behavior as you have noted which is why you we could add a title we could add a label all separately this is the default behavior of PyLab to be specific. Often when we have multiple plots in the same picture, we need to explain what each is, which is where a legend comes into play. So, let us use a legend now. As you notice, it is almost always almost English commands, title gives you a title and so on. Please note the square bracket. Why is it required? We already know square bracket is a list. Since a legend has to be a has to be a list, because there are multiple lines for each one of them, there is to be a legend. So it is a list. And please note, we just said sign 10 and sign 500. Python took care of identifying which one is which all right so this is the legend the position of the legend can be changed sorry I did not give the center in quotes. You have to give the center in quotes. You will find now the legend has moved to the center. So, there are different locations you can put it in. Sometimes you do not want two separate, so you want two separate pictures, you do not want everything in the same place. For that we have a figure command. Let me clear this screen, so that we can Now, you notice there are two pictures, this is one, this is the other, one in blue and one in green. On a larger screen, you can see both of them side by side. So, the figure command essentially is a way of directing the commands. When I say figure 1, it says whatever command I type now applies to figure 1. If I say figure 2, whatever command I type now applies to figure 2. So, if you look at the commands we have done, just look at it, it is a 
figure 1 plot x comma sin x b, figure 2 plot x comma cos x g. So, this directed it. So, anything else I do, for example, I put a title here, it will apply to figure 2. Well, the other one will not have a title, because the command only applies to the figure for which you have chosen. That even includes the save, save fig command. Now, switch to figure 1, let us give a title, close command will close the figure. Now, you can see there is only one picture, there is not any, uh, the second one is not there because it has been closed. Now, you will not see a single picture. So, the close command is useful to, all right. This whole idea is multiple plots. The first type of multiple plots is to produce two separate plots. Sometimes you want subplots. The command to use is a subplot. As you can see, it says two rows, one column plot number 1 to be accessed. Instead of figure 1, now you say you know what I want a subplot. There are there are going to be two rows, one column and the first one is what I am accessing. When we said figure 1 and figure 2, they were completely separate plotting areas. When you say subplot, it is in the same. As you can see, this is the idea of a subplot. can have four, two rows, two columns, which will give you four different plots and so on as per your need. Subplots are very, very useful. The idea is you want to show in one area two different behaviors rather than putting into the same plot. All right. Now, let us get into the next topic in a some sense in a, the next uh, next subtopic that is plotting data. Till now, we have been plotting y equal to sin x, y equal to cos x and so on. Very, very rarely do we need to do that. More often than not, we will have a experimental data to be plotted. So, the data is what we normally plot. But remember, even though we said we have been plotting analytical functions, we have been plotting 
data only. It was generated by using an analytical function, still we were plotting using data. What do I mean by that? Let us see what You remember P is our Lin space, now we plotted P and sin P, but when we type sin P what actually is produced? As you can see, it is an array itself. So, the type of sin p is also the same as p, it is an array. So, in a sense, we have been plotting data, even though we have looked like plotting analytical functions, but we are going to actually look at something. compared to such generated data, you are going to plot more experimental data. There is a file called primes.txt, which is part of the content you should have. Yes, it is part of the test underscore files you should have downloaded. There is a file called primes.txt. Let us look at what is there in it. It is there here, Srikant. This is what you should see in the file. 2357, all the primes below 100 is stored in that file. Now, this is typical for any data you want to work with. There are many ways of taking the data in, but the best and the fastest is using the function called load, load text. It is very powerful. So, this essentially loads the content of the file primes.txt into that variable primes. So, let us print primes and see what is it is. Let us first look at what is its type. It is an ump, it is an array, ND array as you can see from numpy and we saw the values are all floating point numbers, which is a characteristic of all computational things, anything is deemed to be a floating point number only. We have another file pendulum.txt that has two data, two column data, the length and the time period. When you are going to load such data, it should be ensured that both columns have the same number of items. So, let us load that pendulum file. Let us look at the file first. So, this is the data. As you can see, it has two columns of data, the length and the time. So, 
let us load this. So, you can see it is a array of lists of lists. It has a more complex structure than the first one. You can see the two brackets. So, it is a list of lists, each list containing the two data in the column in the each line of the file. Okay. Instead of storing in a list of lists, you can store it in two separate variables by using the unpack directive. Let us do that next. I can say instead of getting a pend array, I should get two variables L and T. I want I also have to say in addition unpack equal to true. That is when it will return two things rather than one list. This is the command I used. Now, you can look at L and T separately. We need to plot L and T square. There is a function called square. We can use that straight away. Since this is experimental data, does not make sense to plot a line, we will instead plot with dots. You should get something like this, try it out. I will give you a couple of minutes, try out and see that you get this sort of a chart. Please note, if you just plotted, you will get a slightly useless curve. So, a curve is not really useful for experimental data. Very rarely is a curve useful for experimental data. So, you are almost always better off starting with a all right, take a couple of minutes, produce this, convince yourself that the data from the file has now ended up and you have produced a plot. All right. Should have got that. Another important plot is what is called a error bar plot. We want to let us see what is this, then we will get an idea. We want to plot instead of a point, the point plus some indication of the error in the experimental measurement we have. The two charts should explain to you the difference. The one we did has simply dots, the one on the screen shows that there is a certain error in each of the measurements. The estimated error should also be shown. So, how do we produce this sort of a chart? Like I have said earlier, Python the commands are simply 
English variable, English names, that is all. There is another file which contains So, it contains the L values and the T values and the estimated errors in the L values and the T values. So, we are now loading this file which has four columns. Of course, unpack equal to true has to be given because we have four separate variables. Then the rest of the plotting proceeds as before, we generate TSQ instead of just plotting, earlier we said plot L versus TSQ, instead we say error bar. and you get this. Okay, try this out, very useful because most often you need to produce charts with error bars rather than assuming the values are exact. Okay. If you have done, We have so far I have been plotting what we could call line plots, you know, either dots or a connected line, but there are other type of charts. You know that we will look at each of these. All right, one of the questions asked, I think it is from Rajalakshmi uh, Chennai, is how to load string data? You are just now seeing the how to load data and specify a type in the scatter plot. So, you can make a guess from that. Make a guess. D type equal to type int is the one for converting it into an integer, but you should remember very rarely you need to you need to load string data because you are not going to be doing any manipulation in arithmetic or you, you, are, you cannot really plot string data. That said, if you if you are looking at using this as a mechanism to, uh, for example, you may be doing some work on probably natural language processing or whatever, you want to upload into a variable all the string from a file, there are other fast other mechanisms available, but normally you will have D type as the option. Another question asked is how to view the saved figure? Saved figure is a file in the operating system. So, whatever your graphics image viewer in your operating system is, you use that to view it, that is all. All right. And thanks for the questions. Let us get back to the I'm typing in the wrong.
Okay. Another question is can we get data from an XLS file? Yes, there are two possibilities once again. You can export from XLS into a text file and use this or there are other libraries in Python available which will allow you to read and write Excel files. You, you cannot do a direct load text from a Excel file. If you want to use load text, it has to be a simple text file. So, the best option is go to Excel and export to from Excel you can export to a fixed length format or a CSV format whichever you like. A little bit of work is required in order to move from an Excel data to a form acceptable for load text. But to answer a slightly different question, if you want to manipulate Excel sheets from Python, it is possible. There are two libraries called Excel RD and Excel WT, which are available to open and edit and even create Excel worksheets. All right. Now, let us go into the simplest of charts, a basic scatter plot. Now, if you look at here, you will see it is all integers. Earlier, if you remember, even though there are primes was an integer data, the answer was shown after we did load text as floating point numbers. This is the way to get integers as integers. scatter chart easiest. So, this is what is called a scatter chart. The very appearance tells you why it is called that because data is scattered all over the place. When do you use it? You use it when you want to get a feel for how the data is, whether there is some large trend. You want to understand it before presenting or before making any conclusions and then deciding on a different way of looking at it. So, this is what we should have got. Okay. We can create different type of charts. A pie chart is very, pie chart is not the most appropriate for this, but we will just try to see how to generate one. Once again, in Python, it is simplicity itself, just type pie. But like I said, this is not the most appropriate use of a pie chart in this particular case. A bar chart is more appropriate. When you have a time series, a bar chart is more appropriate. So, this you will get. Once again note the very simple direct bar for a bar chart, pi for a pie chart. Python has always aimed at being a very readable and a easy to use language.
as you can see the next exercise is to plot a log log chart of y equal to phi x cubed. If you are connected online, you can look at matplotlib because matplotlib is the underlying engine which PyLab is using for generating all those graphs and charts. Matplotlib's power we have not even scratched. It is a huge, hugely powerful uh, package. So, this particular example, I am not going to type it in. Please go ahead, try it out for yourself. Remember that what is the most appropriate chart to use is in some sense your understanding of what the underlying data represents. Once again, remember we are using analytical functions like y equal to phi x cubed here, but in real life you are going to x and y will come from a data, uh, measurement data and that would be most probably coming via a low text type of a command. Here we are trying to understand the log log that is all. So, we are using a simple uh, analytical function, but it is very unlikely you will be doing log log of analytical functions. And the whole idea of a log log is to produce log log tells you something has a certain behavior when looking at it. Okay. The most important data type for scientific computing in Python is arrays. Arrays look like lists, but you know lists are heterogeneous, arrays are restricted, arrays are homogeneous and arrays have a very high performance implementation. The same operations you can do using lists, it will be considerably slower. So, all computation when you use, you use arrays so that the computation is very much faster. One of the simplest ways to create an array is from a list. So, essentially you use the command array which creates a, an array and uses the list as the provider of the basic data. It is important that we distinguish between an array and a list. For all practical purposes, they look the same. Arrays are definitely significantly faster any computation. Let us look at the similar to lin space, we have a a range command. Let us look at the a range command. As you can see the a range command gives you does not include the last element as before. Now the shape command so instead of single set of 8 elements we say it is a 2 by 4 array. You can see what happened before and after the shape command. Before the shape command AR2 was a single array, one dimensional array. Now, AR2 dot shape, we said no, we do not want to treat it as one list of 8 elements, we want it to be treated as two lists of 4 elements, and we got this. Let us try another example. So, effectively you are folding a single long list into multiple lists, arrays. Once again this is useful if you are going to be reading a multidimensional array from a file. A file is by definition unidimensional, you can read it in and then get it to the shape you want. Okay. So, let us look at some special ways to get some special arrays. which produces an array which is essentially, we know what it is I am sure, it is essentially the identity matrix.
So, it will produce a 4 by 5 array all filled with zeros. There is also a series of commands available which end in like. Remember our old friend A3. Now I can say zeros like A3. So earlier the earlier command we gave was zeros four comma five that produced a four by five array with the element zero. Now this will produce a three by three. That's what the idea of a zeros like is. You don't have to specify the dimensions. Instead, you give an actual array with the dimensions you want, and zeros like will produce an array where all the elements of zero. Its shape will be the same as the argument given. And if you also notice, the D type, the data type is also same as the original. It is not zero point zero. It is zero since array has integer elements b has integer 0 rather than the floating point 0, 0.0. Similarly, you have ones, ones like these are useful in many contexts, we will see that how useful they are shortly. Let us look at the operations on the arrays. Please type out the commands on the screen and check and decide what actually is the meaning of say A1 plus 3. A1 is here. So, when you say A1 plus 3, what should happen? Test it out and see what happens. Similarly, A1 minus 7, A1 star 2, see what happens. I know you would have seen that the plus operation is something that is applied to all the elements of the array. One of our students in earlier batch said this nicely. In Python, you think wholesale, do not think retail. So, plus is every operation is applied to all of the elements. So, if I say A1 star 2, but note that A1 is unchanged. It returns a new array, A1 remains unchanged. So, you want to capture it, you have to store it in another, try out the operations also and see what happens. So, we have essentially updated the array in place, we can do that. You see a type called in 32. Now it has become float 64. So far we have been multiplying by scalars. We can of course add arrays, multiply by arrays, but please note that this is element wise multiplication that is each element of a1 
each element of A1 is multiplied by So, this is A 1, this is A 2. So, A 1 star A 2 is element wise multiplication. Of course, you can store it in another variable and capture it and so on. So, far the only real difference you would have seen compared to a list is the operations and the fact that there is an underlying D type. Lists are heterogeneous, so there is no type of for a list, arrays there is a underlying type. Now, let us do something, how do we access elements, how do we change them? As usual indexing starts from 0, how do you access an element like a list again A of 2. Same for two dimensional arrays. You can see in the last line of the slide that C one element is being changed. Please type the A and C arrays because we are going to have more examples using that. I am sure it will take a little bit of time to type the numbers. All right. So, let us you can access one of the biggest differences is that you can assign to a row. You can see on the screen indexing is similar to a list, but there is a very interesting in the last two points you can see that you can say C minus 1 equal to C minus 1 happens to be a row, C is a two dimensional array. So, C of 2 is essentially the third row, C of minus 1 is the last row. So, I can say C of minus 1 equal to 0 and make the last row 0 in one shot. So, accessing a row works very, very simply. Accessing a row is very simple. This gives me the first row and so on, but how do I access a column? In other words, how do I get 1, 4, 7? It is easy to get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, but how do I get 1, 4, 7? Now, the answer comes from the fact that you need two indices to access an individual element. The first is the row index and the second is the column index, right? Now, if I could say that the column in the, the row index remains and the column index changes I get a row, but for that I do not have to actually say the column index varies, I simply say A 3 of 0. For columns it is slightly different, if I say A 3 colon simply says all rows, I am using the A 3 because I do not want to type that C once again, please you try out with C. This as you can see is, let us have A 3 in sight, so that the last column is accessible this way. It is not very difficult, simply remember A comma B is the way to access a row and a column, colon tells you all the values that is all. So, for that matter, will give you 4, 5, 6. So, there is nothing special. We simply, this also will give you 4, 5, 6. Some people even would suggest in order to be consistent, you should always use 1 comma colon for even for rows, but that is very, that is a little unusual, but that brings it to the fact that there is nothing 
peculiar about accessing columns this way. Rows and columns are both accessed by saying give me a column number, allow the row number to vary completely. That gives me a column. Give me a row number and let give me all the columns in that row, gives me a row. So, both of which are on the screen, you can see that. Once again, we can assign all the elements in a column to a single value by using this notation. All right. Okay, the next part in arrays is something to do with slicing and how to use arrays for very simple image processing. I do not want to start that topic now, we may not be able to complete it before lunch. Plus, I want some time spent on any questions from your end. I understood that the programming test performance was rather poor. We are, we are a little disappointed. So, the plan of action is to today's afternoon session after lunch, we will do a review of programming for some time and continue with the advanced python tomorrow. We are fairly ahead of the schedule in these sessions. As you can see, we have done about 50 percent of the slides already. So, we will take advantage of that and use the rest of the afternoon for reviewing programming uh, related topics. So, people should come prepared with some questions, anything you want to, when you do not understand to ask. Let me repeat, we will review programming in the afternoon, but please come prepared with questions, difficulties you have. We will break now for lunch, see you back at 9.30.